Hi everyone. I am K R Rajagopalan from Kanjipuram. I am pursuing C A final and currently I am in my C A articleship training. First of all, thank you for having me as a resource person for auditing. Let me start with the definition of business. A business refers to a person's a regular occupation, profession, or trade, which is a commercial activity. As you all know, a business cannot be started without an investment, and of course, investment requires money. If I am not wrong, I can say that money rules the world. Yes, of course. and there are many industries in business for example agricultural and allied industries automobiles banking aviation cement and e-commerce manufacturing etc there has been tremendous increase in trade during 19th century this evolution of trade requires greater financing which a single person cannot afford therefore the practice of joint ownership of enterprise or forming a company begins the owner who is the investor of the company did not know anything about the business or they might know little bit yes in order to overview the reliability of the financial position of the company in which they have invested they nominate an independent third party to examine to investigate the accounts prepared by the management this process is termed as an audit and the person who does this work is called auditors the word audit and auditors are very transparently showing that they are related here is the definition of audit an audit is a process of systematic independent examination of statutory books accounts records etc of an entity to ascertain how far the financial statement and non financial disclosures reflects the true and fair view there are many stages of audit process the very basic is know your customer or organization kyc process performing field works that is collecting information from the client and obtaining the appropriate evidences and start analyzing it and in final the auditor should express his opinion in a written document called audit report in short audit is an independent examination of financial information of any entity the entity may be profit oriented or npo and irrespective of the business size or its legal form the main objective of the audit is to express an opinion on the financial statements let us see what are financial statements financial statements are written records that convey the business activities and the financial performance of a company financial statement comprises of balance sheet which shows the financial position of the company as on date income statement which shows the financial performance of the company during the year cash flow statement which measures how well a company generates cash to pay its debt obligations funding its operating expenses and working capital management statement of changes in equity and notes which is form part of financial statement the financial statements are used by investors to make decision regarding investing in the company market analyst to analyze the performance of the company and company's stock price creditors to evaluate company's financial health and its earning potential debtors employees government for statutory purposes etc all their decision is based on the opinion expressed by the auditors on the financial statement of the company therefore the auditor should take care to ensure that his opinion 
on the financial statement would not mislead anybody the companies act 2013 states that auditing standards are mandatory for the audit of financial statement of companies in india auditing standards or professional standards for the auditing of financial information it is issued by the institute of chartered accountants of india icai and subsequently approved by the ministry of corporate affairs mca auditing standards provide minimum guidance for the auditor that helps to determine the audit steps and procedure that should be applied to fulfill the audit objective we'll come back to auditing standard later before we will see the provision relating to eligibility qualification and disqualification of an auditor as per companies act 2013 Section 141 of Companies Act deals with eligibility, qualification and disqualification of an auditor. The main provisions are a person shall be eligible for appointment as an auditor of a company only if he is a chartered accountant. In case of partnership firm where majority of partners are chartered accountant then a firm may be appointed as a statutory auditor for the company where a firm including a limited liability partnership is appointed as an auditor of a company only the partners who are chartered accountants in the firm shall be authorized to act and sign on behalf of the firm now let us see subsection 3 of section 141 along with rule 10 of companies audit and auditors rules 2014 this deals with disqualification of an auditor a body corporate other than limited liability partnership registered under the limited liability partnership act 2008 cannot become a statutory auditor for the company this is because a body corporate follows a separate entity concept the separate entity concept states that the owners are different from the company as you all know the auditor's responsibility is to express the opinion on the financial statement if he expresses the wrong opinion then he is the sole responsible for misguidance this concept restricts a body corporate to act as a statutory auditor for the company next an officer or employee of the company cannot act as a statutory auditor of the company in which he is employed a person who is a partner or who is in the employment of an officer or employee of the company is not eligible to act as a statutory auditor for the company let us see a example there is a company called abc private limited and you are the employee of the company now you also own a personal business you employ mr y as your employee for your personal business now assume mr y is a chartered accountant and can mr y be a statutory auditor for abc private limited no because this provision restricts the next is the person who directly or through his relative or through his partner is holding any security or interest in the company or its subsidiary company or its holding company or its associate company or a subsidiary of such holding company is not eligible to act as a statutory auditor for the company let us explain you with the example there is a company called abc private limited and you are a chartered accountant you are having a security value rupees 5000 on abc private limited now you are ineligible 
to act as a statutory auditor for ABC Private Limited. If you are holding the security through your relative, there is a proviso in this section. We will see that. It may be noted that the relative may hold security or interest in the company of face value not exceeding rupees 1 lakh. Here is the another example. Let us assume there is a ABC private limited company and your relative Mr. X is holding a security in that company of 5000 shares face value each is rupees 10. So the total comes to 50,000 rupees, which is less than the threshold mentioned in the proviso. So you are eligible to act as a statutory auditor for ABC Private Limited. In another case, your relative Mr. X is holding 10,000 shares of rupees 10 each. Now the value comes to rupees 1 lakh which hits the threshold mentioned in the proviso. Now you are ineligible to act as a statutory auditor for the company. Hope you understand both the case. Let's proceed. This proviso of having face value rupees 1 lakh is applicable only when your relative hold the shares in the company. And when the auditor himself or through his partner is holding any security of even small value shall make him disqualified. The grace period of 60 days is available when your relative hold the face value of rupees more than 1 lakh in the company to make the corrective actions. Next, when your person himself or through his relative or through his partner is indebted to the company or its subsidiary or its holding or associate company or a subsidiary of such holding company in excess of rupees 5 lakh is ineligible to act as a statutory auditor for the company in which he is debted. When a person himself or through his relative or through his partner has given any guarantee or provided any security in connection with the indebtedness of any third person to the company or its subsidiary or its holding or associate company or a subsidiary of such holding company in excess of rupees 1 lakh is ineligible to act as a statutory auditor for the company. When a person or your firm who whether directly or indirectly has a business relationship with the company or its subsidiary company or its holding company or associate company or subsidiary of such holding company or associate company is ineligible to act as a statutory auditor for the company. Business relationship refers to any transaction entered into for a commercial purposes. Commercial transactions which are in the nature of professional services permitted to be rendered by an auditor is not considered to be as having business relationship. And the commercial transactions which are in the ordinary course of the business of the company at arm's length price shall not be considered as having business relationship. A person whose relative is a director or in the employment of the company as a director or key managerial person is not eligible to be a statutory auditor for the company. A person who has been convicted by a court of an offence involving fraud and a period of 10 years has not elapsed from the date of such conviction is not eligible to be a statutory auditor for the company. As per section 141.3G of Companies Act 2013, a chartered accountant can maximum hold 20 companies for audit. In this count of 20 companies, the following companies are excluded. One person companies, dormant companies, small companies, private companies having paid up share capital of less than 100 crores. 
So, when the person hold maximum 20 companies, he is ineligible to act as a statutory auditor for the 21st company onwards. And this limit of 20 companies is applicable for per person. And in case the audit firm contains three partners of which all the three are chartered accountant, then the maximum audit that the firm can accept comes to 60, which is 3 partners into 20 audit per each partner. That counts to 60. At last, when a person renders the service which are listed in section 144 of the Companies Act 2013 is ineligible to be a statutory auditor for the company in which he is rendering those services. Let us see section 144 of Companies Act 2013 which prescribes certain services not to be rendered by an auditor. The illustrative list are maintaining accounts and bookkeeping services, doing internal audit, designing and implementation of any financial information system to the company, actuarial services, investment advisory services, investment banking services, rendering of outsourced financial services, management services and any other kind of services as may be prescribed time to time. For example, Mr. X is providing the services of investment banking to C Limited. Later on, he was also offered to be appointed as an auditor of the company for the current financial year. Now, Section 141, Subsection 3, Clause 1 of the Companies Act 2013 disqualifies a person for appointment as an auditor of the company who is engaged as on the date of appointment in consulting and specialized services as provided in Section 144. Section 144 of the Companies Act 2013 prescribes certain services not to be rendered by the auditor which includes investment banking services. Therefore, Mr. X is advised not to accept the assignment of being auditor of the company. Now, let us see Section 139 of the Companies Act 2013 which contains provision regarding appointment of auditors. For the purpose of appointment of auditors, we classify company as government company and other than government company. The first auditor of other than government company is appointed by board of directors within 30 days from the date of registration. In case the board of directors files, Members in extraordinary general meeting can appoint the first auditor of other than government company within 90 days and the first auditor of other than government company hold the office till the conclusion of the first annual general meeting. Now, the first auditor of government company is appointed by comptroller and auditor general within 60 days from the date of registration. In case when Comptroller and Auditor General files, Board of Directors can appoint first auditor of the government company. Even when the Board of Directors files, members in extraordinary general meeting can appoint first auditor of government company within 60 days and the first auditor hold the office till the conclusion of first AGM. The subsequent auditors of other than government company is appointed by the members in annual general meeting and the person who is appointed can hold the office from the first AGM to the sixth AGM subject to fulfillment of certain conditions. Here is the concept of rotation of auditors applies. Whereas, subsequent auditor of government company is appointed by comptroller and auditor general 
within 180 days from the commencement of the year and he hold the office till the conclusion of the AGM. Where a person appointed as an auditor of the company incurs any of the disqualification as we saw in subsection 3 of section 141 of the Companies Act 2013 after his appointment, he shall vacate his office as such auditor and such vacation shall be deemed to be a casual vacancy in the office of the auditor. The casual vacancy section 139 subsection 8 of the Companies Act 2013 deals with filling of casual vacancy. The casual vacancy for other than government company is to be filled by board of directors within 30 days of that occurrence. In case of resignation, appointment by board of director shall be approved by company at annual general meeting. Whereas in case of government company, the casual vacancy is to be filled by Comptroller and Auditor General within 30 days. In case of failure, Board of Director can fill the vacancy within 30 days. Section 139 subsection 2 deals with rotation of auditors concept. This concept doesn't apply to one person company and small company. Whereas it applies for the following classes of company. All unlisted public companies having paid up share capital of rupees 10 crores or more all private limited companies having paid up share capital of 50 crore rupees or more all companies having paid up share capital of below threshold limit mentioned above but having public borrowings from financial institution bank or public deposits of rupees 50 crores or more as per section 139 subsection 2, any listed company or the companies that I have mentioned above shall not appoint or reappoint an individual as an auditor for more than one term of five consecutive years and in case of audit firm, the tenure is two terms of five consecutive years which is ten years. And an individual or audit firm who has completed the tenure as I am mentioned now is subjected to cooling off period of another five years. In this cooling off period, he is ineligible for a reappointment as an auditor of the same company. Now, I am going to tell you some of the rights and duties of an auditor. The auditor of a company at all times shall have a right of access to the books of accounts and vouchers of the company. This right of access is not limited to those books and records maintained at the registered office or head office of the company. The right also extends to the branch records. The next right is to obtain information and explanation from officer. The auditor is entitled to require from the officers of the company such information and explanation as he may consider necessary for the performance of his duties as an auditor. When the auditor is not provided by the information or is denied to access the books, he can qualify his audit report. The auditor of a company are entitled to attend any general meeting of the company also to receive all the notice and other communications relating to the general meetings. Therefore, the auditor has the right to receive notices and to attend general meeting. The auditor has the right to report to the members of the company on the accounts examined by him and on every financial statement which are required 
by the Companies Act 2013 to be laid before the company in general meeting and the accounting and auditing standards and the matters which are required to be included in the audit report under the provision of companies act 2013 shall be discussed and to be presented in the meeting at last the auditor has the right to lien an auditor can exercise lien on books and documents placed at his possession by the client for non payment of fees for work done on the books and documents but the following conditions should be satisfied documents retained must belong to the client who owes the money document must have come into possession of the auditor on the authority of the client that is they must not have been received through irregular or illegal means the auditor can retain the document only if he has done work on the documents assigned on him such of the documents can be retained which are connected with the work on which fees have not been paid now let us see some of the duties of an auditor section 143 of the companies act 2013 specifies the duties of an auditor it is the duty of auditor to inquire the following items whether transaction of the company which are represented by merely book entries are not against to the interest of the company whether any loans and advances made by the company have been shown as deposits whether any personal expenses have been charged to company's financial accounts when the shares have been allotted for cash whether the cash has actually received and if no cash has actually received the auditor must ensure whether the position as stated in the account books and the balance sheet is correct regular and not misleading to emphasize the important duty of an auditor is to report on frauds if an auditor of a company in the course of the performance of his duties has reason to believe that an offense of fraud which involves or expected to involve individually an amount of rupees 1 crore or more is being committed or has been committed in the company by its officer or employees the auditor shall report the matter to the central government within such time and in such manner as prescribed in case of a fraud involving lesser than rupees 1 crore the auditor shall report the matter to the audit committee or to the board and such frauds shall be disclosed in the board's report in such manner as prescribed every auditor has the duty to comply with the auditing standards while performing his duties and an auditor as also have the duty to sign the auditor's report or sign or certify any other document of the company the qualifications observations or comments on financial transaction or matters which have any adverse effect on the functioning of the company mentioned in the auditor's report shall be read before the company in general meeting when the audit report is qualified the report shall also state the reason for the qualification and of course it is not worthy that scope of the duties of an auditor has generally been extending over all the years 
at last section 147 of the companies act 2013 deals with punishment for non compliance if any of the provisions of section 139 to section 146 is contravened the company shall be punishable with the fine of minimum 25000 rupees but which may extend to 5 lakh rupees and every officer of the company who is in default shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to 1 year or with a fine of minimum 10000 rupees and which may extend to 1 lakh rupees or with a both imprisonment and fine if an auditor of a company contravenes any of the provision he shall be punishable with a minimum amount of 25000 rupees and maximum amount of 5 lakh rupees where an auditor has been convicted under subsection 2 which means he has done any fraud and fined by the court he is liable to refund the remuneration received by him from the company and also pay for the damages to the company in conclusion we have seen appointment of auditors eligibility qualification and disqualification of auditors rotation of auditors concept rights powers and duties of auditors and lost punishment for non compliance hope you had a great time with me thank you for your patience thank you